Hey, well, good evening, friends. Good evening. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you so much. It is an honor and a blessing that you have brought yourself to this place um, to have just such a special and really unique opportunity tonight um, to hear a really, really powerful message from Daryl Burton. Daryl is a pastor at the United Methodist Church of the Resurrection. It's the largest United Methodist Church in the country. And um, he has a really powerful story of God's grace in his life, and I'm excited for you to hear it. When he was in his early 20s, he was falsely accused of murder and put in prison and spent 24 years there and was exonerated in 2008. And now he has, he tours, he speaks all over the country, even internationally as a sought after speaker and um, tells his story of God's grace, hope, healing, and forgiveness. And he also, this is, this is extra special tonight. He also brought three friends with him that also have powerful stories of how God has worked in their lives as well. Um, and I think it's going to be eye opening for us to hear some of these stories now. That's the stuff, you know, I'm supposed to share. Oh, one more thing. He, in 2017, Daryl started um, a nonprofit organization called the Miracle of Innocence, and I hope he gets to speak more on that, so that um, he has been working with this organization to do what has been done for him and to seek um, justice for wrongly imprisoned persons and um, racial justice, and he's going to tell you a little bit more about that organization and what they do. So that's all the stuff, but I also want to say, what I want to share too, is that um, Daryl and I went to the same seminary and we worked together for a year um, at the Church of the Resurrection. And he's not just a sought after speaker and a, a man with a powerful story. The most important thing about Daryl that I value so deeply is he is a man of faith. And he is one of the most, you'd be hard pressed to find a more gentle and genuine and compassionate and servant hearted person um, in this world. And I'm just so blessed um, to be around Daryl is to feel lifted up. He's one of those folks that um, the Holy Spirit just uses to bless people. And I know that you're gonna be blessed tonight by what these gentlemen have to share. So Daryl, we invite you to come forward and, and uh, get started. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. I really appreciate that, and thank you to Amy and Christy invited me. You know, and my I would like to say my little brothers, who will get a chance to share their stories here in a little bit. And I think about this Bible story called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? So there was three, and then there was one more. Not to say that I'm one more, but, <laughs> but uh, and that's what they remind me of, because they were so young when they went to prison. I was, you know, a little bit older. And so going to prison as a, you know, a young adult is far different than going to prison when you're a kid, a teenager. And they're going to share just a, a few minutes of their stories. But at any rate, thanks to Jim and Beth, you know, Sunrise. Uh, church, you know, for having us. It is truly a privilege and an honor to be here tonight uh, to, you know, share what has been an amazing story. You know, my good friend Amy and I went to seminary uh, together a few years ago, and, and she was, I mean, they just excelling in seminary. I was struggling, really, I have to tell you. I don't know how I made it through seminary. I really don't, must, by the grace of God, because I didn't understand technology. It was, it was really challenging for me. You know, all this stuff, it didn't exist. And I'm looking at these computers and devices and you know, big screens, all this stuff just, it was not of our world when we went in. This, so all this is new to us. I'm also joined by my beloved wife, Valerie, and my cousin, Joe D, uh, from St. Louis. And so, you know, and I'd just like to uh, give them a round of applause, at least because. <laughs> they have. They have followed my journey all my life. And in particular, you know, we've been knowing each other since we was, you know, this high. You know, well, Valerie was a little bit younger than us, but however, you know, I, I, better, I better put that in there, you know. But uh, truly, this is a, these are human stories. And so when we tell these stories, it evokes all kinds of emotions. Some parts make you laugh. Some parts make you, you know, perhaps get emotional. 
make you weep, some parts make you angry, because these are true human stories that happen to human beings. Unfortunately, through the criminal justice system, a system that some of us believe is the best system in the world. Well, it's not, because it's, it's, you know, it's run by human beings. And I can just ask the question, how many of you in this room have made a mistake in your life, right? That's a few of you have not, you're perfect, but I, I, I get it, I get it, you know. And so I'm gonna tell you this story, you know, and give you just a little backstory of you know, where I was born and raised, you know. And so whatever emotion that you feel, you know, and emoting, it's okay, it's all right, you know, and we can take it. Um, I was born and raised in a large family. My grandmother had nine children in the city of St. Louis. Uh, and we was raised in the Baptist faith tradition. Any recovering Baptists in the room? <laughs> you don't want to admit it, but that's all right. We ain't mad at you. But, uh, you know, we had to go to church. In the Baptist faith tradition, we went to church a lot. You know, like Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. There was a lot of church going in my grandmother's house up to a certain age. You know, I know Jody know what I'm talking about because she was right there with me. It's my first cousin. Up to a certain age, you was going to church. That was the rule. Now, if you was, you know, 13, 14, maybe something like that, you know, a teenager, you didn't have to go. That was your choice. I couldn't wait to turn 13. <laughs> you know why? There was no more church going for me. I was done with church because I felt I had enough Jesus in my life to last five lifetimes. And, but, you know, <laughs> my grandmother said these words. She said, you know, boy, one of these days, one of these days, you're going to need Jesus. I just hope you remember to call on him. And I said, yeah, Grandma, whatever, whatever, right, right, and dismissed it. Behind her back, not in the face, she would hit me with a frying pan, so my grandmother didn't play it. She didn't play that. <laughs> but she was right. But I'm going to refer to some scriptures tonight. And I'm going to refer to Luke's gospel, you know, chapter 23, verse 34, chapter 23, verse 47. Now, you know, in these scriptures, Jesus said, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And then in... Luke 23, 47, it says, the centurion, seeing what, they had, what had happened, praised God and said, surely this was a righteous man. And some interpretation says, surely this man was innocent. I'm also talk about Matthew's gospel, you know, verse 5, I mean, chapter 5, verse 43, 44, 46, 45, 46, but at any rate, and I may paraphrase some of these, but, you know, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And it goes on and talk about how Jesus was challenging people to love folks whom they hated. And he was talking to me because I hated a lot of people. I hated the entire criminal justice system. So how can this guy Jesus tell me to love these people after what they had done to me and sent me to prison as an innocent man? It's hard to love somebody you hate. It's hard to pray for somebody you hate. So I'm going to refer to those scriptures you know, uh, throughout this uh, presentation. But anyway, let me just move you right along about the story, because that's what you come to hear, right? You want to hear the story, you know, and it is a, a story that don't belong to me. The story belongs to God. It's bigger than me, you know, and it's, you know, something that happened to me, something that happened to us, you know, that I feel compelled to tell, you know, and in fact, I'm too afraid not to tell this story because I know it delivers people, it ministers to people, it brings people to faith. It gives people hope. And that's the message. The message of this story is about hope and forgiveness because I had neither one. I was not a man that had hope. I was put in a hopeless situation and I was not a forgiving guy for many, many years. So let me just bounce you forward. My mother wanted to be a copycat after my grandmother. She had nine kids, okay? But she did in reverse order. My grandmother had seven girls and two boys, so my mother had seven boys and two girls. And I'm right in the middle, four older, four younger than me. And so of all of my brothers and sisters, I'm the darkest of the family. Some would say the black sheep by birth. And so, you know, I got teased, right? When they would pile on, when my, my brothers would, you know, do all of them, when I was the bun of the jokes, they would call me things like Oreo, chocolate chip, milk, dub, midnight, lights out, shoe rubber, tar baby, jet black, blue black, black on black, triple black, you name it. Anything had something to do with being dark, I got teased about it and didn't like it. I didn't like my dark skin. I was self-conscious, insecure. I was ashamed of my black skin. And you know, my mother, I would ask her, you know, mom, what happened to me? Why am I darker than everyone else? 
did you leave me in the oven too long? What happened? <laughs> hey, then she teased me. Go home, baby. You just my little chocolate drop. Man, it ain't funny, mama. You teasing me too. I don't like my dark skin. But my dark skin happened to be my saving grace. It was my dark skin that later on brought me out of prison. And I get to that when I tell the story, part three of the story. Three-part story. Start, middle, ending. Beginning, middle, ending, right? Any story is told. That's how they told. You know, played in music, written in books, you name it. Movies, yes, they tell these stories in three parts. And so here's the first part. There was a gentleman. He was pumping gas into his automobile one night, and a man approached him and shot and killed him. Three or four people gave a description to the police the night the crime was committed. They said the man they saw commit the crime was about five feet five, five feet six inches tall, medium to light skin. That excludes me. <laughs> Look at me. You turn the lights out and I disappear, I'd blend right in with the darkness, right? Me, light skin, this is like as I'm ever going to get. You know, and in summertime, I'm like everybody else. I get a tan too. I darken up, right? So how do you confuse me with light skin? No motive, no ballistics, no DNA, no confession, no weapon, no fingerprint. Nothing connecting me to the crime with one exception. Witnesses. Guys who came into court, raised their hand, and they gave an oath. Anybody know what they said? I swear to tell the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me, God. Now, I didn't believe in God, never blamed God. I had no problem with God. God didn't exist for me, never angry at God. But human beings, I had a problem with them human beings. Lying before this so-called God that they believe in, they were making mockery of God. God didn't exist. Keep God out of this. Let's deal with them human beings. So I had a lawyer who I call a public pretender. Any lawyers in the room? I hope I'm not stepping on anybody's toes, but, but at any rate, a public pretender, this lawyer who pretended to defend me, I saw one time. I had a three-day trial, and I was convicted in less than an hour. It happened so quick, it would make your head spin. And what I also learned is that the lawyer, the public defender, and the judge, and the prosecutor, they had this sidebar where they had a conversation and they was talking about another suspect. This other suspect, he not only fit the description, but he had shot the victim on three different occasions. Three different times, one, two, three. The fourth time he shot the man and killed him. These, you know, the judge, the prosecutor, and the defense attorney, these people, they talked about something that was very crucial to this case and they knew it was so important. And that was they had the right suspect who was out on the streets and they had the wrong man inside of the courtroom you know, and this is a picture of the courtroom. And they said we got to keep that information away from the jury. They agreed to keep that from the jury. You think I became infuriated by the criminal justice system? You know, that just, you know, it heightened my hate toward anybody that was a judge, lawyer, prosecutor, police, defense attorney, anybody that was, you know, connected to the criminal justice system, God, I hated you. I hear hate in my heart, deep-seated hate in my heart. Anywhere in the world, didn't make any difference where you, you, know, where you practiced law or, you know, or was working for the criminal justice system. And I was equal opportunity hater. I hated them all equally. They were all the same to me. It made no difference to me. Man, woman, black, white, Hispanic, Chinese, Japanese. If you worked for the justice system, I hated you. And no one knew that but me and God. But I knew what was in my heart toward those people. And so they brought me into this situation for the crime of capital murder. I'm facing the death penalty, and there's only three other crimes, uh, two others outside of capital murder that you can receive the death penalty, and that's espionage and treason, as I understand it. So any one of the big three, you can either get life or death. And I'm an innocent man, and I'm thinking at this time, this, you know, I'm the only person in the world that's going through something like this. This just doesn't happen in America, in the criminal justice system. Well, it does, and it goes back thousands of years, and I'll tell you about it in a, in a second. And so they brought me over for sentencing after they convicted me. And uh, they waived the death penalty. And they sentenced me to life without parole for 50 years plus 25 years consecutive. So that meant I had to spend 75 years in prison. I'm about 22 years old, so 75 and 22, you can do the math. And these gentlemen had the same sentence, all of us. So that's why I know we miracles walking around out here. Every one of us. Yeah, you can clap to that because we miracles. These guys... Yeah. 
to come from out of that hell, I'm telling you, you know, excuse my language, Lord, forgive me, but he know that was hell on earth. And so they waived the death penalty and sentenced me all that time. And when the judge brought me over for sentencing, he asked the lawyer, you have anything to say? The lawyer said, no, Jan, I don't have anything to say. I said, wait a minute. I want to say something. Now, remember, I'm an angry young man. I'm angry. I'm furious, you know, at this system. I said, you, Yana, you, this courtroom, the police, the prosecutor, the defense attorney, these snitch witnesses, all of you all are part of this conspiracy. You confiscate my freedom. You framing me. And I'm an innocent man. Jurors said, I didn't find you guilty. Your lawyer didn't find you guilty. You mad at anybody, be mad at the jurors. That's who found you guilty. I said, but no, Your Honor, you saw those people coming here and lie on me. You saw them submit perjured testimony against me, and you can do something about it. He said, this court and no other court is going to overturn what 12 jurors of your peers have decided against you. And he was right. No court, state, federal, all the way to the Supreme Court, would overturn that jury verdict. Last thing I said to that judge is, I don't know how long it's going to take but I'm going to fight this case till I prove that I'm innocent. They took me out of the courtroom, put me in these shackles, and they took me, but you know, before that, there was a young lady. I want to show a picture of this young lady, if you can. And, uh, and Jennifer's running, the, somebody's running it for me. I don't know who it is. Jennifer, thank you, but whoever it is. No, I think it's, it's Lori. Is it, no? Somebody back there, tech people. I don't know how this stuff works, but I do know it works. But see this, you see this young lady? And she's beautiful, isn't she? Yeah. Yeah, isn't this? Platform. That's my daughter. But the last time I saw her before I left the street, she was seven months. Seven months. I held her three times. I didn't see her again until she was turning 25. So that's heartbreaking. I lost all those years with my little girl. All those years, you know. And if I could change or do anything differently, you know, that would be the one regret. If I had to do it over again just to have a relationship with that little girl who's a young woman now. But that's something that motivated me. She was my motivator, kept me, she was my driving force. I knew I had a little girl out there that I wanted to get back to. But then they took me to this place called MSP, Missouri State Penitentiary. All of us spent time in this madhouse. Time Magazine wrote an article about this prison and they described this place as the bloodiest 47 acres in America. And it was. The bloodiest 47 acres in America. And you can Google that, or you can ask Siri or Lexus, one of them, not one of them names. They'll find it for you. But it's out there in cyberspace. Every day, three men got stabbed or assaulted in that place. You know, and sometime a man got killed. Sometime a guard got assaulted or hurt. And sometime the guards were doing the assaulting and hurting. Sometime inmates. So it's just, it was a horrible place. I mean, they brought us inside of this. This prison, they put, you know, brought us in this unit, this huge room. And before we got to that room, it was this huge banner, you know, and they may remember this banner. It said, welcome to the Missouri State Penitentiary. Leave all your hope, family, and dreams behind. That was the introduction into that place. You know, we saw that. We saw that. that that's what they meant. No hope for you. So remember I told you this message about hope. They said no hope here. It's like Dante's inferno. He who enters here shall never leave alive. They meant that. No hope in here. Family can't help you and your dreams be like nightmares. They stripped us down. I beg your pardon, ladies. They said get on to your birthday suit. They took these five point shackles that they had on us. Two on our wrists with black boxes. One on our waist. Two on our ankles. Took them off and then say get naked and stand spread eagle. And they sprayed us under our arms and our genital areas. They turn around, bent over, squat. Sometimes they say cough. And they sprayed us in our buttocks area with some kind of bug repellent for lice. And then told us to sprinkle off in these showers in a prison that was built in 1836. You know, and then they assigned us these prison identification numbers. The number they assigned me was 153063. I'll never forget it. It's in my memory forever. And I bet you they won't forget those either. But I hated it. I hated that number. It's branding us like we're animals. You know, we're not even human beings anymore. And then they toss us off in these cages and these cells. You know, and I recall sometime they would call over the intercom system. Burden, 153063, report to your housing unit, report to your job site, report to the captain's office. And I wouldn't go. It was time when I first got there, I didn't, I didn't report. And then the guards would come and they'd be angry. Burton, didn't you hear your number being reported over the income system? No, I heard your number being, you know, called on the income system. It's not my number. 
My name is Daryl Burton. That's the name my mother gave me. They said, well, if you don't obey that order, we're going to put you in the hole. Put me in the hole? <laughs> we already there. What do you mean put me in the hole? This whole prison is a hole. And they put me in the hole. And I said, <laughs> that means 23 hours out of a day. <laughs> Locked in a cage. It can drive you batty. You know, you, you know, got very limited human contact. And a few days later, I'd be, let me out the hole, man. I you know, obey that order. I need to get to the law library. That's what I'm thinking. You know, but here it was that, you know, you're in this prison. And we in this prison, you know, and nobody really, you know, really care about what you're going through or what you're dealing with. Inside your head, you know, you can't really find your, you know, at least bring yourself to care about too much of anything either except surviving and trying to get out. I remember the first day they put me in this housing unit. You know, in a housing unit like this here, and these in cells like this here, but I think you can go to another picture. In a housing unit like this here. See these long corridors? And they got tiers goes up several stories. Rows of inmates. First day in this housing unit, they put me in another guy. We had our bed linen, our clothes, and our arms. He was going to his cell he was assigned to, and I was going to another cell I was assigned to. But I heard, you know, we got behind you know, these what they call JC gates. These tall gates, and they lock them with these six-inch skeletal keys. And when they lock that gate, that's your only way in, and that's your only way out. You ain't got but one way in and out of that housing unit. And they locked the door, boom. And then this guy walked a few feet, and we heard some rumbling, boom, 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 boom. And turned and looked around, we saw two guys chasing two other guys, and they were stabbing them. Day number one. The day that I was released, August the 29th, which is, you know, my anniversary is coming up here next month, August the 29th, excuse me. They was rushing the man to an infirmary, the prison hospital. A guy had cut his throat from ear to ear, tried to decapitate him. And so much more in between. You know, I mean, these are images that we would never forget. You know, it's not like we can unsee what we've seen or unhear what we heard. And I know a lot of you all saw last year what happened to this guy named George Floyd. Did anybody not see it? You all saw that, right? Yeah. Well, you know, just, you know, and I, I'm sorry to say this here, but this is just the reality. But well, that's something that seemed like in prison, that happens way too often to see somebody get hurt like that or get killed like that. And there ain't nothing we can do. You know, you can't go up, hey, man, don't do that or leave that guy alone. You can't get involved in prison. So what happened is George Floyd, you know, whether it's a guard or an inmate doing that to a man in prison, you just pretty much, you know, powerless to say or do anything. If you do say something, then you're drawing yourself in. If you, know, if you try to get involved, then you got to be ready to get involved and go all the way, and it could be fatal. That's the prison world. You know, that's the world where we live 10, 15, 25, 30, 30 plus years. All these guys did more time than I did, and each one of them younger than me. Not that much younger, but they're younger than me. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But at any rate, these guys and myself, you know, we had to deal with this hell and with this torture for far too long, decade after decade after decade. And so I want to just talk to you now about, you know, my process as to not only just trying to get home and, you know, get out of prison, but actually trying to get back to God, you know, and make this conscious contact with this thing called God that I didn't believe in. So the first thing I began to do, I began to work on my case. I became what's called a pro se litigator, acting as my own attorney. Remember, I didn't like lawyers, hated them, but I needed them. You know how that's, that's kind of love hate relationship. You know, I don't like lawyers, but I need them. <laughs> yeah, most of my friends today are lawyers <laughs> all over the country. In fact, I'm leaving Saturday, going out to Colorado to be around a bunch of lawyers, about 50 of them. And I tell them, man, I don't know how this happened. God must have had a plan or a sense of humor. <laughs> I'm always around all you lawyers. <laughs> Straight up. But listen, you know, so here it was. I began to act as my own attorney, and I began to write motions, pleadings, briefs, you name it, to the courts. And they wasn't probably written in the best legal, you know, I guess writing that you could put before a court. But I, I mean, I was fighting for my life. And every court would deny me. And I write another motion, and they deny me. And another one, they deny me. It could have, you know, my middle name could have been Daryl Denied Burton. I got denied so many times by the courts. <laughs> then I went on a letter writing campaign. And I wrote hundreds and hundreds of letters from the United States to Canada to Europe. I wrote heads of states, governors, senators, presidents. You know, I wrote, you know, Republicans, Democrats, independents. I wrote Oprah Winfrey. I wrote the big O. 
<laughs> I love them, but they got in touch with me twice since I've been home. I'm like, you're a day late and a dollar short. What would you have when I need you? <laughs> Don't tell Oprah I said that. I love Oprah. But I'm, I mean, that's the kind of mind I got. I'm thinking, I'm out now. Help the next guy that's in. Go and help him. You know, is what I say to you all. That's why we got miracle ministers. Help because we know the other men in that place that shouldn't be. You know, even when they done 20, 30, 40 years, I mean, God, my goodness, when you going to let a person out? So at any rate, I wrote to church. You know, I know y'all church going, folks, but I got a bone to pick with you because the church wouldn't help me neither. The church wouldn't help me. And I heard the church supposed to help sinners. When I'm in the club, <laughs> I'm in the sinners club, church wouldn't help me neither. So you know what? You know, which I was not a man of faith anyway. I said, well, there's so much about the church people. You know, they doing their own thing and got their own God. They don't want to share them, but that's okay. I ain't mad at it. And then I saw on 60 Minutes. It was an organization to help innocent people get out of prison. It was uh, started in Princeton, New Jersey, the first organization to help innocent people get out of prison. And uh, they started in 1980. I heard about them in, in 1990. I got locked up in 1984. So in 1990, they was on this program helping this lady get out of a Texas prison. She had served nine years for a murder she didn't commit. I said, well, they helping innocent people get out of prison. They got to help me too. And I wrote them. And they wrote me back in 1990. They said, yes, we help free innocent people who are in prison, but we're a small organization. That's them right there with limited resources. They said, we get thousands of requests every year from inmates who claim to be innocent. And out of all those requests, out of a thousand requests, we take two cases a year, maybe three. If we take your case, it'll be 10 years before we get to it. This is in 1990. I said, well, good. I'm going to write you for 10 years. I had 75 years, so I had time to write. You know, I mean, I said, I'm going to write you. You know, you ain't said nothing to me. 10 years, okay, I, got, I, got, I know I got to do at least 10 more. And I wrote them for 10 years. <laughs> Twice a year sometime. They took my case 10 years later in 2000 and got me out eight years after that, 2008. So that was 18 years from the first letter I wrote to the organization. I had already served over six years, which brings the you know, sum total to over 24 years. You know, as Beth said, 25 years. <laughs> Just round it up. But that's a long time. But here's where things begin to change for me spiritually. You know, and I had went through different programs with, as it relates to religion, you know, especially those Catholic programs, them Catholics. When them Catholics came in, I got on all them Catholics out counts. You know, when they came in with the residence encounter of Christ, and they was not judgmental. You know, and I know it's in the scripture also, I didn't put this up there, but somewhere Jesus said, when I was in prison, did you come visit me? Anybody ever heard that scripture? Matthew's gospel? Yeah, chapter 25. Well, I know I used to use that on some of my kinfolk because they was Christians, right? Long for a long time. I said, hey, Jesus said when I was in prison, did you come visit me? I ain't seen y'all yet. Where you at? <laughs> they still didn't come. <laughs> so I couldn't, couldn't make them feel guilty with them. But at any rate, you know, let me just say that uh, I began to, uh, I began to sense that something had to change inside me spiritually, you know, because this anger, this hate, it wasn't doing anybody any good, and especially me. And so in 1998, same year had I received the death penalty, is when I would have been executed. All my appeals had been exhausted by then. I wrote this letter, most important letter I've ever written in my life. It was to Jesus Christ, literally. Wasn't a prayer, wasn't a plea. It was a challenge from me. And I said these words, dear Jesus Christ, if you real and you know all things, you, and I know I'm innocent, if you help me get out of this place, not only would I serve you, but I'd tell the world about you. Sincerely yours, Daryl Burton. Didn't have a mailing address, folded that letter up, put it under my mattress, got rid of it after two days because I knew if the guards come in and find this letter, they said, man, this guy's writing letters to Jesus, to God. He's going cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. We got to put him on, they call it fifth floor in prison. <laughs> you know, it's a nut ward. So I didn't, you know, think much of it, told the letter up, and I'm thinking, you know, two reasons. God didn't exist why I wrote it. The first reason. The second reason was... When somebody come to me talking about God and Jesus or any religion, I'm like, look, I've written him a letter. He ain't answering my mail, so I don't know what God says, you know, you've been communicating with because he don't exist. You know, so just let keep God out of this. Well, here was three signs, you know, and I know you can probably go back to at least one of these scriptures, you know, in, in, a, in a Luke's gospel, in chapter 23, Luke's gospel, chapter 23, verse 47. The first sign is, when this organization is called Centurion, remember the name Centurion? That's where they got the name from, that gospel. You know, the Centurion that was seeing what was happening to Jesus. 
And they took that name and they started an organization called Centurion. It called Centurion Ministries at the time. That's where they got the name. Surely this man was innocent. Depend on, you know, your, your interpretation of the scriptures. One of them say that. That's why they took the name. So that was one sign. The second sign is the man who founded the organization. See that little bald head man right there? And I can say bald head. We got the same hairdo, right? His name is James. One of Jesus' apostles' name is James. And you see the lady next to him, the third sign, the kicker for me, with a law firm downtown. That's my lead attorney. You see what her name is? Cheryl Pilot, as in Pontius Pilot. You can't make this stuff up, right? <laughs> I mean, if you know the Bible story, even Ray Charles, this blind man, was trying to see somebody was trying to communicate with me. My grandmother had died by this time, and guess what? Her words kept echoing in my head. Boy, can't nobody help you get out of this but God. Nobody but Jesus. I'm hearing this here, but I'm still not wanting to receive an acceptance. So I said, I need a little bit more. You got to show me a little bit more. God, because I'm from the show me state, so you, I need to see just a little something else. Well, I was challenged. Somebody said, well, why don't you get a Bible, Daryl, with red letters? You know, if you get a Bible with red letters, them quote straight out of Jesus' mouth. I said, well, that's what I want to read. Nothing but the red letters. What did Jesus say? And again, them scriptures that we talk about, Jesus said, love your enemy. Love my enemy. Love these people I hate. He said, love them. And the second thing he said was, pray for them. Pray for him, and I'm thinking, yeah, right, I pray for him. I pray a building for him, one of them fools. That's what I pray. That's, I'm angry. I hate these people. You know, that's what Jesus said, pray for him. And the third thing he said was forgive him, which take me back to Luke's gospel again, chapter 23, verse 34. That one verse in the Bible, not a lot of biblical commentary, not a lot of theological study, not a lot of, you know, religious, you know, information. One verse touched my heart. That's it. Luke's gospel, 2334, when Jesus was beat, spit on, whipped with a cat of nine tail, the crown of thorns, put on his head till he bled. And when he was at the cross, them words, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. To me, that was divine. That was not human. How could this guy do this? How could he forgive these people? And they killing him, and he's an innocent man. At least five times it was said he was innocent. Pilate said it three times. One of the robbers on the cross said he was innocent. And then the centurion said he was innocent. So at least five times this guy Jesus was claimed to be innocent. Now, I didn't know about anybody else being innocent. It goes back at least 2,000 years for Jesus. Then a guy named Joseph before that, and him, he was innocent. So innocence, it don't just happen to people like us. It happened to our leader, our you know, religious leader. For us, the Messiah, the Christ. So if it happened to him, then who am I? <laughs> it can happen to me or any one of you. And I can ask you the question, have any of you ever been accused of something you didn't do? By a show of hands? Some hands didn't go up, so I mean, you must have did what they said you did. <laughs> yeah. Every one of us been accused for something we didn't do. But you can't imagine being put in a box for 25 years, for 25 days for 25 hours, but that's what happened, you know, to people like us, unfortunately. So let me just tell you now about what they did to bring me home, you know, and then I'm gonna call up, you know, you know my, my little brothers. What they were able to do, the lawyers went back and they discovered that there was a woman, the night of the crime, she was a gas station attendant, and she told the police the night of the crime, as well as at my trial, back in 1985, and she is not a young woman. She had moved away to Baltimore, Maryland, and they found her and they brought her back. But she said, Black, in 1985, the day of the trial, she told the police that day, hey, you got the wrong man. That's not the man who committed the crime. That man is too dark. Remember my dark skin? What I was ashamed of? You know, I can kiss myself today. <laughs> Boy, Black look, <laughs> Boy, Black looks so good on me. <laughs> I heard somebody say, Black of the berries, sweet of the juice, dark of the skin, deep of the roots. <laughs> Tupac, one of them rappers said it, but I love it. <laughs> what I was ashamed of came to my rescue, my dark complexion. That didn't come out until 2007, all the way from 1984, 85, 2007. That's a miracle. They also discovered one of the key witnesses for the prosecution said he had a couple of convictions when a man had know, about 12 convictions. Said he was facing a couple of years in jail. He was facing 30 years in jail. That's what motivated him to come 
and tell a lie against me. He was trying to get out of his trouble. He had done something like this before in another you know, murder case. He was on record as being a professional snitch. And also five months after he testified against me, he signed a sworn affidavit saying he lied on me, wanted to recant it and retract it. That didn't come out to 2007. Again, another miracle. So that's why we call you know, ourselves miracle men. So I just want to say, as a, I'm going to call up Bobo first, but I want to say that you know, today I'm not bitter, but I'm better because our God is bigger than anything we ever face. You know, they arrested me, us, but God rescued us. You know, and out of those tragedies, it's used for God's treasure to give God the glory. Much bigger story, because we're on a crusade. We're still trying to bring people home from prison, and we're going to need y'all help. You know, and so I wanted to tell you about Miracle of Innocence. That's an organization that we founded to help other innocent people get out of prison. But we'll help other folks get out of prison as well, but mainly innocent people, you know, and this is what we are, you know, we're led to do. It's because of that suffering. I don't get a chance to tell y'all how, you know, what it was like when I came home, you know, because I don't have the time. Maybe I can come back and that's, that's another story. But coming home, it's not easy either <laughs> after you've been gone all those years. But you got some information I think you picked up, and if you want to, you know, connect with us, if you can give us your emails, we'll give you some updates, you know, about what's, you know, coming on board or how, you know, these cases or how they're developing. And this gala we're going to have on October the 15th, we're getting a, you know, very special talent, filmmaker, that's going to be there, who's going to be the keynote speaker. His name is Kevin Wilmont. I don't know if any of you have heard of him, but if you watch this movie called The Black Klansman or The Blood, well, he is the film maker who got the Oscar for one of those films. You know, you know what Oscar is, right? You know what the Oscar? Yeah, well, he got one of them things, a gold something, I don't know. But at any rate, he's going to give a keynote address, you know, uh, at our gala, October the 15th. And it's open to the public, and you're welcome to come. So look, at this time, you know, I'd just like to invite Bobo to come up and share a few words. Then after Bobo, it's going to be Mike and then Rav. Come on up, Bobo. Come on up. Sidney Roberts. <laughs> Hello, my name is Bobo. In uh, 1988, my, Bobo, my, my name. You, you can take your mask off too if you want to. Yeah. 1988, my name changed to 171590. I was given uh, life with no parole plus 50 years for a first degree murder on criminal action. Uh, I was devastated by that. You know, I seen my mother was tore down by it. I, I destroyed families in my actions, and I had to make some serious decisions. I had to grow up fast. So my father, may he rest in peace. You know, I didn't know I loved my father until he died. But he told me, he said, you finna go where the big boy's at. If a man mess up with you, if he snooze, he lose. So they told me I was going to an environment where you have to rise to a certain level of violence to protect your manhood, you know. And that was my whole biggest focus. Focus. I was not gonna let nobody make me a punk. I was not gonna be nobody's boy and none of that in prison. So anyway, when I went to Fullerton, the first thing they told us to do was to strip butt naked at the front entrance of the door and walk down the hallway butt naked in front of all type of men that was gawking at you, whistling at you and all this stuff. But you know, you had to take it. So, scared at that point, started getting my mental burns. Then I was uprooted from there and I was sent to behind the walls. That was that got the style of prison. And woo, it was so, it was like a jungle. And I remember I was going through R&O. &O. It was an old white lady, casework. She came in, she said, listen, we're not here to babysit y'all. If you feel you can't make it, either check in or find yourself a daddy. Whoa. Mm. So there it was. So I, I knew look, uh, Ralph, we used to roller skate on the streets before we came to prison. He was back there, a couple other guys I knew. So they helped me get my mental burns. So that was cool, you know. Then I ended up getting rolled to Potosi. That was a reality check for me because that showed me if I didn't, if I didn't wake up and get no fat on my head, I was going to end up dying in prison on either, more than likely on death row, because I didn't know if you kill a man in prison and you already got life with no parole, 
Only thing they're going to give you is life with no parole or the death penalty. So I'm down there. You know, I'm kind of wild, you know, and older brothers like Dalmore, Ralph, Fat Mike, guys, you know, that know me, cared about me. They said, man, you need to get your mind right. You know, grow up. Get into these books. Read your case. Stayed on me, okay? You know, that, you know, it's cool, but, you know, at my age, at my maturity level, looking at some books, it's foreign to you. You get sleepy. You, you inter you're just not interested in it. So time went on. Then more, he brought together this rap group. It was a positive rap group. We was doing music, some positive, keep us out of trouble. So, you know, time went on. You know, I started studying. I started growing. Then down in Potosi, that's the only state in the state of Missouri that death row inmates is in population with you. Every other state, they're separated. But at Potosi, you know, they are in population. They can be your cell. Even the superintendent was allowing them guys to stay out like two, three days before their executions. So you, you build a rapport with these guys. You, be, you start building relationships with guys. So imagine you've been around a guy for 10, 15, 20 years, and you've been on death row, and they walk up to you, and you're looking at them, and they got this, this lost look on them. And you say, what's up? Man, the state that set my execution date. What can you tell a person that's been doomed, uh, condemned to die in a matter of two, three days? You know, you can't tell them nothing, but you see the, the fur, the helplessness, the host, uh, hopeless look, and the lost look. And, and, and that really impacted me. And it impacted me to the point I started literally losing my mind down there, where I'm, I be in a hole, and I can hear my mother's voice, and I'm answering in the hole, ain't nobody up in here. I'm having thoughts saying, what good are dreams to be brought into reality when you don't have no one left in life who cares to share them with? You know? You, you better off dead. I'm having all these attacking thoughts. So I said, guys, something ain't right with this. So my granny ended up passing, and that took me to one of my lowest points to this day that I've ever been to. I never felt totally alone in emptiness in my life. And I felt a certain darkness. So from that point, I started really tapping into my spirituality. You know, you know I, I believe differently. I'm, I'm like a free spirit when it comes to tapping into the God sense. You know, because everybody see God differently, you know. But it's some nerve, it's something greater than us. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when man lets you down, you can go to whatever that spirit is, that energy is, and tap into it, and you're gonna be all right. <laughs> so this particular time, you know, I was kind of wild a little bit and fighting a lot in Potosi. And, and this dude named Nixon, he was a caseworker. He was a real rotten guy, man. He was, he, he was a racist. He was real rotten. He was, a, he was a sergeant. Anyway, I'm trying to get away from Potosi because what they're doing down here, they're exposing, they, they really playing up on this racial hatred down here. I never was, was exposed to racism until I came to Potosi. So I said, man, I got to get away from this place. So instead of this guy doing the right thing and getting me away from this guy, he committed me into this nut unit down here without my consent. That's to lock me up in the cell and just throw away the key and I just rotten in the cell. So when he took me over here, he took me over here, I walked up to the cell I was supposed to went into and it was a white guy, he, it, it stunk so bad you could smell him through the cell and it was smog all over the window. You know, so when he took him out and put me in the cell as is and closed the door, it was fecal matter smeared all on the walls and stuff, it stunk. And you heard guys in the vent say, little brother, man, tell him to take you out this cell, man. This dude got tuberculosis. Anybody understand, know something about tuberculosis? This airborne, it could kill me. Mm -hmm. So I prayed on it. And I look back at that type of moment. I didn't get myself through that on my own. I don't care how much I worked out and what I thought I knew. Mm -hmm. I didn't get through that on my own. It was something bigger than me that got me through that. Okay, so... 
All my appeals is final. So now I got to tell my family, well, I ain't never coming home. My appeals is dead. So I start losing more and more hope, you know. I'm studying. I'm respecting everybody because that's just the right thing to do. But I'm starting to have this anger because I'm like, man, you know, I'm not no bad person, even though I'm in here for taking a life of somebody. But where's forgiveness for me at? You know, so I just kept on, you know, trying to live right and, and, and just respect everybody. So we go to, we get sent to the new walls after the old walls. I mean, the new Jefferson City after the walls. And I'm, I'm sitting up in the cell looking out at the window up at the sky. And the time just, just was just beating me down. Beating me down. I'm tired of waking up in prison. I'm, I'm just ready to go. I'm tired of it. It's nothing else for me in here. And uh, I said, God, I'm sorry. And I feel, inst I feel instant relief. And I told myself, I said, man, man, I just, you know, was feeling this time beating me down. And I asked God, man, I'm sorry, forgive me. And I felt instant relief. He said, man, you're going home, man. I yeah. said, huh? He said, that was sincere repentance. Yeah. And this was in uh, 2010. This was before the ruling came down in 2012. So I'm walking the fence line in 2012. And a white guy, a friend of mine named Jason, he came back and said, hold on, bro, man, we got something in the courts. So I said, I don't have nothing in the courts. Mm. So, okay, cool. So about probably almost a month later, he come back and said, man, we won. I said, what we win, man? We going home. <laughs> I said, going home? Ain't nobody <laughs> tell me nothing about no going home. <laughs> so he said, I sent you the case in to the Miller versus Alabama. So I read it, and I read it, and I read it, and it scared me. I'm like, what? <laughs> so, here I am, man. You know, <laughs> I'm out here with my brothers. You know, you know, we going skating. Me and Jack, Ralph. You know, you know. So, you know, we got a job. You know, I bought my first car in my life. <laughs> You know, it's just a blessing, man, to stand out here. With that, I say, God is good. <laughs> Mike, yeah. Amen. Amen. That's right. Good evening. My name is Michael Vincent, and um, I was recently released from prison on October 26, 2020, from doing 31 years, 10 months. I went to prison at 15 for a horrible decision I made. Grew up, broken home, mother was 14, father was 16. Things I witnessed in the house were horrible. So when I took to the streets, I vowed that those things would never happen to me on the streets. Um, a mistake was made September 1989 where I took a guy's life. Immediately went to prison. They sent me straight to MSP, 15 years old. <clears throat> I'm lost. What do I do? The, the guards telling us fight or have sex with men. The sign, leave all your hopes and dreams behind. At 15, I'm seeing this, and I'm like, who are my role models now? Now my role models are rapists, murderers. These are the guys that y'all put me around who y'all want me to learn from. Also, these guys were preying on me. So now, a lot of decisions I gotta make. Who to trust, who to do this, who to, you know, so, I had to trust in God. And uh, my grandfather, he was a Jehovah Witness, and he used to always tell me to pray. He like, pray, just pray. We praying for you, just pray. And I didn't know how to pray. You know, I'd say a few things, God forgive me, and all this and that, it was just, some to please my grandfather. Although he didn't know, I always told him I prayed. I didn't have a clue. Um, went, to, went to Potosi. I'm a kid growing up around men who are raising me, then they're killing them. So now I'm suffering again. I'm 16, guys raising me in prison, but they're taking their life too. I'm dealing with all this. 
as well as my family out there getting killed. And I'm dealing with all this on my own. And I'm making decisions that later on in life cost me, you know, a lot whole time, time in prison, more time that I caught in prison for defending myself. After so long, I'm just like, well, I got to get myself together. And that's starting with how I think. I had to change how I thought about a lot of things because I was bitter for a long, a long time in prison. <laughs> so I changed how I thought and I started having acceptance. And if I didn't have acceptance, that's why I had a lot of problems. So I, got, I have acceptance now. Um, got out of prison, family was there to embrace me. Um, my life has totally changed. I'm no longer that 15 year old kid. I'm 47, I just had a birthday June 29th. I'm 47. <laughs> I work, got my own apartment. Uh, and it's been, it's been good. I mean, it's, it's, uh, at my party, my family asked me, how would I describe my life right now? And I told them, it's awesome, regardless of the ups and downs. These are, what I'm going through now, I never had opportunity to go through because everything I was doing then, it only involved men. I'm dealing with men. So now I have to adjust because I'm already dealing with women. And I can't react to women the way I did to men. So that's a big step for me. But I think I'm doing good. I think I'm doing good. Uh, my family love me. They're glad I'm home. Uh, it's a blessing to be out here. It's a blessing. Everything that happens to me right now, today, I look at it as a blessing. Where I'm at right now, today, on this stage, it's a blessing. I never saw this coming. Five years ago, you couldn't have told me I'd be out here speaking like this. So everything, I pay attention to every little thing that happens to me because I know back in 89, when I was 15, I made a horrible mistake. And I was judged for that. I mean, and I, I was so naive to the court system. I thought the guy in the black robe had the last say so. I was proven wrong. God had the last say so. <laughs> so, um, again, I've learned from my mistakes. Uh, I know the consequences of things. I no longer involve myself in stuff like that. And it's because of how I think now. You know, I have no problem with apologizing. I don't, I'm at peace with who I am today. I'm at peace with who I am today. I no longer have an image. I took the mask off. And I'm a free man. And I thank you all for having me here tonight. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ralph McElroy. And the first thing I want y'all to know that I was absolutely innocent of the crime that they charged me for in 1987. I did 34 and a half years before the decision came to let us go. I was already in court well, with the help of Miracle of Innocence, proving my innocence. And we, we still haven't got everything done yet, but we're right there. I should have got it heard. But anyway, I'm gonna give y'all some of my background. Uh, I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri too. Um, uh, my mother raised me for most of my childhood. Then I went to my father's side but anyway, uh, on March, I mean, March 87, I was arrested for a murder, uh, which I didn't commit, as I said before. Um, the people at the scene never said that I did. They said someone else. The police, for some reason, hid the statements from these witnesses and decided to pin the case on me. And they even made some witnesses say that I was the one that committed the crime. And me being 17 years old, I was a juvenile like them as well. I didn't know anything about the court system except for what I read and heard and seen on TV. So my family was easy to influence me to think that uh, everything is gonna be okay. These people, they went to, to college and they're gonna save you to stay job. And I did have a good public defense. I had a hung jury in my favor it was like, a, I don't know, uh, what was it, seven to five in my favor. The first time I had a pretty good public defender. She was still a public defender. She did a good job. And I'm thinking I'm going home. And then they gave me a public defender that never tried a case before. 
and she didn't know what she was doing. She didn't even know people in the audience was telling her to object, you know, things like this. So I went to court with her, and I got found guilty. And I went to prison, and I didn't know a thing about prison. Even though I was a strong guy, um, I didn't know anything about prison. Much like these guys, we've seen a lot of horror. Uh, rapings, guys getting killed. I think I was there a few days and I saw them bring somebody out on the gurney. He got killed in the gym uh, for beating up somebody or something. I don't know what happened, but I wasn't really concerned with that. When I went to prison, I was in love um, to my childhood sweetheart. And I fought to get back. I never accepted prison. I fought to make it back to the street from day one. I struggled uh, with going home because I was innocent. I'm fighting with everything I have to get my freedom back. I was young, I was young, but I knew I had to get my freedom back uh, because I had a life without parole sentence, which meant forever. So um, that's how I spent most of my time. And I was there to greet them when they came to make sure that they was all right. And uh, up to this day, I'm still fighting. I want everybody to know that. But um, mostly, Prison was horrible. It was a horrible life. And then I met uh, Daryl in prison. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was always a, a strong, positive influence. And he was in a library too, like me. We was fighting to get our freedom. And he got released, and I was so happy for him. And he kept saying, you know, when we reached out to him, that your day gonna come, keep fighting. And uh, my mother came back into my life. and. She helped me get an attorney, and then uh, Miracle Innocence came into my life, and everything changed. I think with the grace of God, they helped me out, and they worked with the attorneys, and we ended up having a hearing. We found witnesses who were there at the scene. We had reports and everything that they made saying that they told the police that I wasn't the one that committed the crime, and that's the evidence that the police we ended up having a hearing down in, um, what was it, St. Francis? St. Francis. Yeah, St. Francis. And uh, the judge still didn't let me out. I don't know why, but they, we pretty much proved our case that I was innocent. And he was basically saying that we're going to have to go to St. Louis and let them do it. And my attorney ended up having a, a, a child, so we waiting on her to come back so we could finish the fight. Finish the fight. <laughs> yeah. But... Uh, Basically, uh, I want to let everybody know that uh, God helped me through it. It was a struggle. And um, I am thankful for Miracle of Innocence because not only did they come through and help save my life, help me mentally, even as I got out, uh, they've, given, they've hired uh, caseworkers and everything to help me deal with what I went through in prison as well as what I dealing through on the street. When I came home, everything blew my mind. You know, technology, cars talking to you. You know, when I went, <laughs> I've, never, I've never seen a cell phone before. So, you know, the cell phone, I, I still don't even know how to work it good. But uh, computers, all this, I'm, I'm, I'm still lost. They still helping me. And uh, I'm still receiving counseling for having to go through, like they said, with people on death row, we watching them get washed away and executed. And you been with this, been with this person for about, I don't know, 10, 15 years, and you've grown to care about this person, and then they execute them. And uh, you know, we really went through a lot in prison. And uh, it was my mother too helped me open up my heart when she came back into my life and helped me heal the wounds of my father because I blamed him a lot uh, for the life that I was in. And it wasn't really his fault at all. He did the best he could, and so did my mother. And uh, I'm thankful for everything that I have today. Like them, we work at the same place. And you know, <laughs> we all are doing good. And I appreciate y'all for hearing my story. And thank you. That's awesome. That's awesome. I don't know. Can y'all just, you know, give him another hand clap? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. That's right. Thank you. You know, I know we got to go. It's just 8.05, and uh, I'm, I'm sure you guys, you know, we don't want to keep you longer than we have to because they kept us way too long, so we know what it's like to let people go. <laughs> but, uh, man, I'm so proud of y'all. I'm so proud of y'all, man. Because <laughs> I remember saying, law's going to change. You're going to get out of here. We ain't dying in this place. Y'all remember me saying that? I told you, I don't care what kind of sentence. I think one of y'all said it. God got the final word, not the guy in the black suit, black robe. You know, and so, uh, Amy, yes, you come back up. I think this, I think this carpet has got I know. some life in this <laughs> was, movie. It's, it's all right. Can, let's just give love one more time to Michael Bobo. <laughs> to Ralph and to Daryl. Um, these men have witnessed things most of us can't even imagine. And so, gentlemen, the, the courage that it takes to stand up in front of people and to talk about some of those things that, that represent your deepest pains, that is courageous. And we will not um, take that in vain. I, we want to um, take what we've learned today and do what we can to make this world a more just place for all of us to live. But I thank you for your courage so much. And I just would like to conclude this evening by praying over these four men. So if you would all come back up here, I would love that. I'd love to lay hands on you. Um, and. Friends, if, if during this prayer, if you want to show your support and, and show that you're adding your prayers to this, I invite you just to kind of stretch out a hand toward them, a hand of blessing as, um, as we pray for them. God, these men are living testimonies of your grace. Lord, they've seen things, like I said, most of us can't even imagine, and we wouldn't wish on our worst enemy. But God, you have redeemed their lives from the pit. I thank you, Lord, for how you've created each one of them, so precious, so unique, so beautiful. I thank you for how you've so worked in their lives, even in the darkest of places, God, to speak to them, to open their hearts, to set them free, to give them hope, and Lord, to turn their eyes toward you, the one who can save. God, I pray enormous blessings fill their lives as they continue lear to learn um, what life outside those walls is, is like, as they learn to navigate even little things that, uh, that we take for granted, God, I pray that you would walk alongside them, be ever near to them, God, and pour out your blessings upon them because you are the one who can give them every spiritual blessing in Christ, all the love and all the peace and all the freedom and all the joy that they'll ever need from now until eternity. Bless these men. And Lord, all of us who've heard their stories today, God, this was a wonderful, unique opportunity for us. And I pray, Lord, that you would so work in our hearts that we could know how to continue to do this important work to make a difference in the lives of your children. And I pray all of these things in the powerful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Daryl has um, 
a booth out, outside these doors if you want to come and get some literature. Some of you already have gotten some. Um, and if there's any questions that you have about his organization or if you would like to donate to his organization, um, that would be a wonderful blessing as well and would help him and these gentlemen continue the work that they do. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.